Welcome to meeting two of Women in Antiquity. Today we're going to be talking about uh, women in the Epic of Gilgamesh, and in order to do so, we'll spend a brief moment giving some background on Sumer, the culture from which this most ancient work of literature originates. Sumer itself is one of our earliest civilizations. Uh, it emerges over 5,000 years ago at the southernmost extent of Mesopotamia, the land between the two great rivers of the Euphrates and the Tigris in uh, Southwest Asia, what is now Iraq. And Sumer develops um, as an experiment in the formation of a new kind of community. The people that migrated into Sumer came from the east in what's marked on this map as Elam, in the, uh, the foothills and mountains of uh, uh, southwestern Iran. And they had been working on uh, subsistence agriculture for many generations in the Neolithic in the late Stone Age. They migrated into the, pla the, the, into the plain between the two rivers um, because it offered much greater prospects for a settled community where they could provide enough food and, uh, and sustenance from the land and from animals to um, develop a culture where some farm and some pursue um, other specialized forms of labor um, that allowed a community to, um, uh, to pursue opportunities that, um, that, uh, that scattered tribes of subsistence farmers could not. Uh, the interesting thing about this is that they develop early on the idea of the city-state. In other words, uh, they, uh, they form um, centralized communities with farmlands surrounding that are culturally, socially, identity-wise facing inward. And this is the key idea. Um, a city-state is not merely a collection of buildings. It is a focus. It is an identity focus. It is an economic focus. Um, it is a cultural and social focus. Uh, the people that live in the um, the fields and 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 farms uh, around the city state bring their produce into the city to trade in the central open space of the market. Um, and they also uh, interact with each other um, in this common central uh, place, um, even if they don't live there from day to day, but live in, uh, in amongst their farms. Um, they connect to the city, and many people live within the city for reasons having to do with um, protection and common interest. Um, there is a religious focus as well. The, uh, the central item here is what's known as a ziggurat, um, which uh, forms the home for the patron god of each city within the uh, culture that, uh, that these people uh, share. Um, one of the things that's characteristic of city-states, in other words, is that each um, city, each city is independent. This is what's meant by city-state. It's politically independent and economically independent, and it has a distinct identity. Um, the people that live in this, uh, in this territory think of themselves as, as being of Uruk or being of Lagash. But they share a common culture. They share um, a, a heritage, a religion, um, and they share a, um, a language. Uh, and so the, uh, the ziggurat, the, the central temple that is the home of the patron god of that city, represents this dual aspect of the city-state culture. Um, the ziggurat is the home of the particular patron god or goddess that that city has chosen 
to be its, its patron deity, to live among them and to uh, share in uh, the, the grace that comes from having the, uh, the benevolence of a god or a goddess. Um, the, uh, the the ziggurat, uh, like any template of uh, like any temple of the ancient world, is not a place for for humans to worship like modern churches. Um, it is a home, a dwelling place, for the god, him or herself, and uh, a place where uh, priests of that god are uh, interact and with the uh, with the divine and conduct sacred rituals that are largely hidden from public view and kept deliberately obscure in part to preserve the power of the priests um, and also um, temples are sometimes used as places of safe keeping for records and treasures um, that um, are protected both by the the sacredness of the place and by the uh, the, the deity themselves. So the ziggurat represents the individual nature of a city-state because that's where their particular god or goddess lives. And yet that, uh, that god or goddess is part of a, uh, a, a pantheon, a collection of, of gods and a collection of beliefs that all of the uh, communities, all of the cities and the, the city-state culture share. Um, and so a particular city like Uruk or Lagash or Ur in, in ancient Sumer would have their own patron deity that they know looks out for the, the needs and wants of their city. And yet that god or goddess comes from the culture that they all share. Each city-state is in rivalry with the others, economically and politically, and, and uh, not infrequently at war um, uh, over the, uh, the limited shared resources of a place like Sumer. Um, uh, uh, the, um, the, the land of Sumer in particular is one that requires very diligent husbanding of resources in order for a community to survive and thrive. And so this is why warfare comes at the earliest stages of civilization in order to protect um, both land and uh, all of the investments that come in, in making a successful agricultural culture that is, uh, has enough surplus food to feed people who are not farming. And so in a place like Sumer, this is going to include um, irrigation works, uh, as well as uh, you know, the property that belongs to farmlands and to the, uh, uh, the city and community as a whole. And the, the people that own property are therefore called upon to defend it as members of their army uh, and are um, are expected to be motivated to do so because they have a stake in protecting their property and the collective property, their individual, um, their individual land, and what uh, everyone benefits from in having a community with the shared goal of collective prosperity. And so some of our earliest records from Sumer include um, the, uh, the detritus of war, uh, this is a uh, peace treaty that uh, was uh, arranged between uh, two warring city-states of Sumer, and it's a very one-sided treaty. Uh, it's called the uh, the Steel of the Vultures because uh, it's depicted with the vultures that are eating the dead of the defeated party uh, that were slaughtered on the battlefield. One of the uh, most central components of Sumerian culture is the deluge. And this is something that is a central pillar of the Epic of Gilgamesh, amongst other things, um, and is, uh, is a key to understanding the Sumerian worldview. Uh, the Sumerians remember a time uh, when the world was flooded, uh, when everything was destroyed by the violent eruptions 
of the rivers and the seas, and and all that men and women had created was torn down, and uh, and uh, the mortality of, of humanity was uh, enforced across the entirety of civilization. Um, the the story is. Uh, includes the survival of a single man and woman who become um, disconnected from the culture that's rebuilt afterwards because they are um, the ones that that violate it. One of the central characteristics of human nature that um, that humanity is to be mortal. The experience of the deluge, in other words, is an expression of the mortality of humans, um, and the um, and the disinterest and hostility of nature, and for that matter of the gods. Um, the the flood represents the destructive power and the capricious nature of of the wild, the capacity for chaos and destruction that is inherent in nature and in the gods who are uh, of a piece with the physical world, who represents the wild, the chaotic, that which is beyond the ordered lands uh, and, and law and order of a civilized community. Uh, and so the, the, the deluge being at the center of, of Sumerian culture, the fact that the Sumerians had to rebuild afterwards uh, um, and constantly be on their guard against the destructive and deteriorative um, elements of the world around them. Um, this is what constructs their worldview, that uh, the Sumerians are pessimistic about the world around them and uh, their idea of achievement is to strive against that, to build and rebuild, uh, to, to work towards creating something that's, uh, that can last and endure against all odds, against the uh, indifference and occasional hostility of uh, nature and the gods. And so uh, the, the Sumerian view of life is one of, of struggle and achievement. Uh, and the Sumerian view of, of death is, uh, is, is one of um, fear of its impotence, that once you have passed into the, into the underworld, into the world of shade, you are no longer capable of achieving uh, you are no longer capable of, of, of creating durable things, and so therefore you are impotent and worthless and pathetic. Uh, this is imagery that you can also see uh, in, uh, in the Epic of Gilgamesh, in one of the tables that, uh, that we are not reading. Uh, and so uh, it, it, the life must be lived during the period that you are alive. Uh, during the time that you have on this earth, you must strive and achieve and create durable things uh, in order to overcome uh, the, uh, the different and negative capacities of the natural world. And, uh, this is one of the, uh, the elements that uh, runs through the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh revolves around uh, a man named Gilgamesh who uh, is king of Uruk, and he is a uh, quite possibly a real historical figure. Gilgamesh appears on the lists of kings from the, uh, the, the legendary time immediately after the floods, and was remembered as one of the uh, the heroes of of Sumerian culture, uh, and so the story that's told around him is uh, an epic tale of of a hero that uh, who goes on a journey um, confronting you know the central questions of of life: what it is to be mortal, what it is to be a man. And uh, involved in the story is uh, uh, both directly and indirectly 
not just the gender roles of, of men, but uh, interestingly enough, uh, and somewhat surprisingly, in, in an adventure story that revolves around an, an epic hero of, 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 um, of, of impressive proportions, um, we get not only indirect testimony, but uh, the direct presence of, of um, the, the role that the authors of this epic felt um, that women have in the, uh, the, the, the maintenance and, and furtherance of culture. The story is, uh, um, is known to us indirectly. Um, we have um, the, the clay tablets that it was preserved on that come from a later population of peoples that settled in Mesopotamia, the, the Assyrians and Babylonians that came afterwards um, that uh, supplanted the Sumerian peoples. Um, and, and even these uh, these copies that came later are still 4,500 years old and uh, um, are um, only barely preserved for us, more or less intact. Uh, the tablet that we're looking at is actually one of the ones that is more intact, and uh, some of them are much less intact. But um, various versions of the, of the legend and different tellings of the tale allow us to construct uh, a fairly decent approximation of, of how the Epic of Gilgamesh was known, uh, at least to the Babylonians who came hundreds of years after the Sumerians, if not uh, quite uh, the version that was told among the Sumerians themselves. Um, so the traditional ways of looking at the epic uh, involve uh, Gilgamesh as a hero, what it means to be a hero, someone who is uh, you know, distinctive and in some ways uncharacteristic, in some ways uh, sort of uh, super characteristic of, of a culture and of you know, the gender expectations of a leading, uh, of a male leader of a society, uh, and also uh, having to do with his function as a as a priest king as an intermediary between the uh, the people and the gods uh, if you remember the what we were just saying about the hostility of the gods this is something that is a paramount importance uh, as a means of protection and so um, the story begins with the the people angry at Gilgamesh because he is uh, uh, indulging in the uh, the pleasures of being a king, and uh, and not fulfilling his uh, responsibilities, his very sober role as champion and protector of the people, um, as as intermediary between themselves and um, the the chaotic power of the gods. And and uh, you know there are. Uh, there are many things about the Epic of Gilgamesh that, uh, that resonate beyond Sumerian society. There's a reason it was preserved by the Babylonians uh, and the Assyrians. There's a reason that this story has been preserved for five millennia. Um, in particular, you know, what it says about the nature of valor um, and the nature of mortality, particularly and especially uh, and the nature of, of connections between men and women and between men and men as being the elemental building blocks of society. Um, the, 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 the stuff of which community is formed, community being um, the, the connection and collection of, of bonds that make possible uh, a society that is more prosperous, more successful, more stable, more safe than just a bunch of people um, that are out for themselves. The characters in Gilgamesh, um, Gilgamesh himself is the central character. Uh, his mother appears in a few key scenes to give us some insight into 
uh, into her role in in uh, um, how Gilgamesh perceives himself and and his uh, destiny. Uh, the other key character is Enkidu, um, the um, the 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 wild man that is brought to Gilgamesh in response to uh, his own um, uh, falling short, his own uh, steering wild of of his responsibilities as a man and as a king. And playing a very key role in in the transformation that Enkidu passes through, and the and the journey, the the character journey that Gilgamesh goes on, in in his connection to Enkidu, uh, is the prostitute Shamat, uh, who is the one of the first people that Enkidu meets after being um, brought into the world and who plays a very vital role in transforming Enkidu from a wild thing into a civilized man. Uh, also in this story are uh, divine and semi-divine characters, Shamash, the, the sun god, uh, Humbaba, who becomes the, the target of, of um, you know, the first stage of Gilgamesh and Enkidu's epic journey, uh, Ishtar is, uh, is uh, the goddess of war and of fertility who um, directly interacts with uh, Gilgamesh uh, and um, who is uh, another way into talking about uh, gender roles in Sumer. Um, it's, uh, it's interesting to talk about Ishtar because the way that she behaves uh, it's it's absolutely vital for the reader to to come to some conclusions about whether Ishtar is behaving the way that she does because she is being seen as a divine figure, as a goddess, um, or whether she's being perceived as a woman. And so Ishtar is to be com compared and contrasted to how Shamat is depicted and how Ninsen is depicted. Uh, and so uh, this is the this is the background for the readings that you're going to uh, be doing. Uh, you're going to be taking a look at uh, the Epic of Gilgamesh itself. Um, there are eleven tablets, and you're looking at uh, three of them that include some of the uh, the key issues uh, involving gender in this story. Uh, one of the first things that emerges at the very beginning of the story that you'll want to look at is the complaints that um, that uh, that the people of Uruk have against Gilgamesh uh, are actually gender balanced. What jumps out at you is what uh, Gilgamesh does in uh, in taking the women who are. Uh, um, who are being married and um, and uh, and um, uh, seizing them so that he has a first crack at them before the husband does on the wedding night. Uh, this is what everybody talks about in the, in these early scenes as being the complaints against Gilgamesh. Uh, but uh, the uh, the townspeople of, of Uruk also complain about uh, how. Uh, Gilgamesh is treating the young men and how he is constantly engaging them in, in fights and, and, uh, and attacking them, forcing them to fight him and so forth. Um, in other words, uh, um, uh, Gilgamesh is, is violating his, his kingly role toward both the young women of Uruk and the young men of Uruk. Uh, um, uh, after this, you see the interactions between uh, Enkidu and Shamat, and how Shamat, uh, uh, through uh, through intercourse, through sex, uh, transforms Enkidu from a from a wild creature into a member of of civilization, uh, into a member of the community. In other words. Um, and what immediately happens after this is uh, is Enkidu then goes to uh, uh, Uruk and forms a connection with Gilgamesh, 
And so these first two moments, these first two beats of Enkidu's story are the bond he forms with Shamat and the bond he forms with Gilgamesh, the female-male bond and the male-male bond. And uh, and both of these are are are, are integral to to um, to how gender is being presented in the story. And then you see the interactions between uh, uh, Ninsun and Gilgamesh, and you see the interactions um, in in where uh, Ishtar confronts Gilgamesh and uh, and demands that uh, or or seeks to convince him to become her husband. Uh, Gilgamesh's response to this uh, has, uh, has a couple of layers, as you'll see if, uh, if you read the, um, uh, the, the articles. Uh, Ishtar's proposal uh, has, uh, has both obvious and not so obvious consequences. Um, uh, not only does he refuse her because of the way that she has treated her past lovers. Uh, but there is also an extent to which, uh, you know, his refusal is a refusal to pass from the mortal life into something else, into being a consort of a goddess. Um, Ishtar uh, herself the original uh, Sumerian name is Inanna. Ishtar is the, the later Babylonian name. Uh, Ishtar herself is uh, is, um, is is complex and, and multifaceted, and so the Harris article deals with um, uh, the levels on which you can look at uh, Ishtar uh, as a as a goddess and as a female goddess. How uh, divinity is understood by the Sumerians and the the lines that that Ishtar straddles as being a, a sort of a unique kind of of a uh, female divinity in the Sumerian uh, pantheon, and then the the Bailey article talks about the um, the the bond between Ishtar uh, between um, Shamat and Enkidu. Uh, and uh, how this uh, relates to um, uh, to um, other kinds of, of similar bonds in, in ancient legend, um, the 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 nature of this transformation and uh, what this says about what Shamat represents. Um, one thing to think about is uh, is why it has to be uh, a prostitute that does this. Uh, it's important to bear in mind that. Uh, that the way we think about prostitution involves a social stigma which is uh, modern in its character. Prostitution, uh, the way we think about prostitution has everything to do with um, Victorian sensibilities and, uh, and the modern uh, construct of, of uh, society. And by modern, I mean from the last uh, couple of hundred years. Uh, the... Um, so this is a this uh, this stigma that we attach to the word prostitute is not is is anachronistic for us to use in describing uh, a shamat and and uh, and prostitutes of the ancient world in general. Uh, the more useful way to think about this is that prostitutes are um, unmarried adult women. Generally speaking, you talk about. Uh, women as being either maidens, uh, uh, you know, daughters who are not yet married, or matrons, um, uh, women who have uh, married and taken on the role of responsibilities uh, of a household jointly with their husband. Uh, and so prostitutes uh, fall into a third category, mature women who are not bonded to a male and have not uh, taken that responsibility. And so um, in that way, they are free in ways that a married woman is not, in ways that a, 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 that a virginal maiden is not. Uh, it is only someone who is free in this way, only a prostitute, um, that could be depicted as, as performing this kind of transformation on somebody who is um, a male version of... of 
this kind of free, uh, you know, a, a wild man. Uh, and so the nature of this transformation um, uh, is, is, um, it is, is, it has to do with what uh, Shamat is capable of doing, expressing the, the female role to its fullest extent um, as, a, as a peer, as a male-female bond. And also, uh, there's a maternal aspect as well. Um, um, there's, a, there's an extent to which you can talk about Shamat um, birthing in Kidu, uh, bringing him out of an inchoate state into uh, the world of civilized men and women. Uh, and both of these are, are elements in the, the Shamat uh, story as told in the Epic of Gilgamesh. Uh, so uh, Sumer and Gilgamesh, uh, this, is, uh, this is a culture that is, uh, that is distant from us in space, but especially in time. And so... Uh, as with all of the uh, communities and cultures and, and societies that we're looking at in the course of the semester, you need to get inside of their heads. Um, leave aside your modern sensibilities. Leave aside the way you think about gender, the way you think about community, uh, and get inside the heads of, of the the characters that, that you're encountering. Get inside... The, the umbrage of the citizens of Uruk uh, and, the, uh, and the confusion and, 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 uh, and revelation of Enkidu as, as he bonds himself with, um, with, with Shamat in this, this transformatory erotic experience and then experiences a different and, and lasting uh, uh, bond with Gilgamesh. Uh, um, look from within and hear the voices of these ancient societies uh, and think about um, the, the complexities of how they view each other and the connections between them.